Hello everyone, my name is Meg and welcome to Online Church Today. Thank you for making time in your day to sit with us and hear the Word of God, to sing praises and to pray together. This lockdown has forced us to be separated in our own homes, but we are united by our common faith in Christ. This week we are also joined by our brothers and sisters in Colac and Camperdown Nurit Terrain. We are so glad to be able to share our service with you. Last week we started a new series on Christian doctrine and today we are focusing on the Trinity. That's a word that we should be familiar with as Christians, but I wonder how much thought you have put into what that really means. We believe in one God that exists in three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. That's a simple enough statement and the three persons of God are clearly seen in scripture. Jesus himself names them together in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. To understand the complexities of the Trinity is beyond our comprehension, but that doesn't mean that we don't try and learn as much as we possibly can. We should take David's example in Psalm 63. David was in hiding when he wrote, You God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. As we seek to learn more about our triune God today, let's raise our voices in praise to our Creator God and King.
Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this amazing world you created and for giving us the joy of living in it and caring for it. We realize that though this world displays your glory, it is also broken and not the perfect world you designed. We recognize that we too fall short of your glory. We are sorry that we disobey you, that we hurt others and that we hurt ourselves. We thank you for making a way for us to be made right with you. Thank you for sending Jesus so that we can be forgiven. Father, we long for the day when Jesus will return and make all things new, when this world will be restored to glory and we will see you face to face. Until that time, we seek to know you more and more. Let your spirit work within us that we may understand you better and transform us to be more like Jesus. Amen. It's time now for our kids talk. Thanks, Ben. Well, thanks, Meg, for praying. And hello, boys and girls. I know we had a great chat with Gilbert last Sunday. And Gilbert, how are you this Sunday? Well, I feel a little bit sad because I can't get out to play and I can't see my friends because we're in another lockdown. Yeah, pretty tough, isn't it, Gilbert? I mean, especially when you can't see your friends because we were made for relationships, um, we people. Did you know that God has always existed in relationship, even before he created anybody? He existed in relationship. Well, I don't really know what you're talking about there, because, like, I know that God existed before the whole world was made, but there is only one God, and so I don't know how he could have been in relationships with anyone else before he made the world. Yeah, well, here's the amazing thing. You're absolutely right. There is only one God. And so before he made anyone else, that's all that existed. But that one God existed in three persons. What? That's, that's crazy. One God in three people? That's unheard of. Yeah, well, let me put it this way. Do you think that God the Father is God? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And do you think that the Jesus is God? Yep. Yeah. And what about the Holy Spirit? Do you think the Holy Spirit is God? Well, I guess so, yeah. Yeah. But you also know that there's actually only one God. Yeah, but now I feel like you're tricking me. I just don't know how they all go together. Because say I have two friends, mm -hmm. George the monkey, he's mm -hmm. a great friend, yep. and Lulu the dog. Um, and then there's you. Yeah, and me. Mm. And Lulu's got curly hair, but that doesn't matter. And we're all friends, and we are all puppets. There is no way that all of us are one puppet. There are definitely three friends. Yeah. It is very tricky to understand, but that's why we say we believe in one God who exists in three persons. We actually say that God exists in Trinity. That's Trinity. a new word. Trinity. 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 There are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and each of them are God, but not so that there are three gods. There is only one God. Well, when you explain it like that, I start to feel a bit dizzy. <laughs> a bit dizzy. Yeah, okay, Gilbert, I know it's very tricky to understand, and it takes a long time to get to know God better. In fact, we will never fully know God until we are with him face to face in heaven. Until then, let's keep reading the Bible and hearing what God has to say about himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so that we can grow to know him better. Okay, so um, I will keep getting to know God and then I will understand, but it will take some time. It takes us all a long time. So let's continue. Let's pray now that we might know God better. Cool. Mm. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a God who makes yourself known and you have made yourself known through your Son and by your Spirit we have come to know you. Heavenly Father, thank you that your Spirit is with us, that we can know your presence with us all the time. Uh, thank you that uh, our Lord Jesus has done everything it takes for us to be friends with you and that we have a heavenly home with you, one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen indeed. You know, Gilbert, I, we've got a few announcements that we've got to tell everybody Ooh, uh, in exciting. our church. 
Exactly. And particularly the people from our own church, Warnable Presbyterian Church. And I'm wondering whether the people out there love craft because Janet Ferguson is starting a group called Drawn Together on Tuesdays, 10.30 till 12 in our auditorium. Drawn Together, it's a very clever name um, of about drawing people together for a time that's social and um, getting to know each other, but also bringing your current craft project, whatever it is, knitting, crocheting, whatever, quilting or drawing. And if you'd also like to learn the skills of drawing, Janet's able to teach you that. So it's Tuesday, 10.30 to 12. Contact the office or Janet if you'd like to be part of that. But... That sounds like fun. It will be fun. But can I do some drawing? Um, well, that'd be a bit difficult because we humans have an opposing thumb and giraffes just have hooves and that. Oh, yeah. They're, they're not very useful unless you're just walking around. That's right. Good for walking, not for drawing. Mm, so, uh, but sad. This, this week we have the lockdown. So it's not going to start this week, that Tuesday group. That's, it's cancelled this week, but it will hopefully start next week. Our Tuesday breakfast is also cancelled. Our growth groups are going online and board of management, which is on Monday night, will be online on Zoom as well. So everything kind of got a bit mixed up. Got a bit mixed up this week. That's absolutely true. But by Saturday next week, hopefully our blokes Brecky will be on at Cardinia. It's the second of four combined churches blokes Brecky's in Warrnambool. And you can register for that using the QR code sent out in the email. <coughs> oh, excuse, excuse me. You're right. Yeah. COVID cough. Yeah. Oh, wait, COVID. I better go. <coughs> I'm glad giraffes don't get that. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. And look, the last bit of news is that the congregational meeting is, we're having one next Sunday at 10 a.m. And it's to hear the congregation's mind on applying for Jake Martin as a Metro trainee for 2022 and 23. Uh, an email was sent out to our folk uh, yesterday, Saturday, uh, with a budget on it um, showing how we anticipate to be able to cover the $10,000 a year for those two years. Um, he, of course, um, raises other funds and there are some national funds that go together to make that up. And also the second thing to consider about applying is that he'll be working together with me on the trainer, he's the trainee. And uh, do you think that that's a good thing for us as a church? It's very likely that we will have an associate January 2022 um, as we've applied for an exit student and we're feeling quite confident about that. Yeah, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on a at the moment. A lot of exciting stuff. Might want to check it out. Check it Pretty out. Pretty cool. For now, we're going to check out Philip Hunt and have an interview with him. Go, Philip. Well, hello, Philip. <laughs> G'day. <laughs> it's great to have you on the couch and uh, to hear a little bit about what's been happening for you because you were with us for eight years in Warrnambool and then you um, went back to Melbourne for two years. What mm. were you doing in Melbourne? Uh, I took on the job as general manager of a church in uh, Cheltenham mm -hmm. and Frankston, but mostly in Cheltenham. Where they had a campus in Frankston as well. Uh, a Pentecostal church led by the Buckinghams, uh, Rob and Christy Buckingham. Rob I knew uh, from previous associations through a well radio initially, uh, he was on 3MP, and then um, through Light FM. We were involved in, uh, in the early days of Light FM in the Christian radio station in Melbourne. Mm. And he was looking for somebody to help him uh, fix up his administration, the back office part of the, of the church. And uh, so I just happened to see something of uh, the job on LinkedIn and uh, knowing Rob and having a chat with Judy about it, I said, what an interesting job that looks like. And she said, you could do it. And I said, yeah, I probably could. And so anyway, we, that's what we did. And yeah, so I, yeah. we spent two years there, Judy and I. So in terms of our culture, would you say that the general manager is like our board of management wrapped up in a position? In a position, yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, it reports to the senior ministers and to the actual board, the, which is like our elders mm. here. Um, oh no, no, it's actually more like the board of a not-for-profit, really, because yeah. uh, in, in the Pentecostal tradition, it's a little different. The structure of the church is a little different. Uh, and um, yes, so everything that happens, looking after the buildings, <clears throat> making sure the staff get paid, 23 staff, um, full and part-time, 
and uh, you know that dealing with little things that come along that uh, like you know a pandemic and mm. all those sorts of things yeah, well, you know you, you would have had a lot to do so you're there in the engine room and what did you learn from them um, things that they did well uh, maybe that we can learn from ourselves. Okay, well they do some things well. They do uh, they do music well, <clears throat> but that's part of the Pentecostal tradition because it's about half the service yeah, right. uh, uh, there, uh, and they do that well. Um, some some better than others, like every place, but uh, generally well. But I think that the thing they really do well is not so much about the church, but about the culture of this particular church, and that is they they respond very quickly to opportunities to do new things. Mm. Uh, we call it pivoting. Yeah. You know, they're able to, they're going this way and they see something and go, you know, we could do that. And so they switch over. Yeah. For example, someone gave us a coffee van while I was there, oh, just yeah. donated it wow. us to us, like $150,000 worth of wow. mobile coffee. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and a, quickly a team formed around that to, yeah. to make a project out of it and raise some f funds for the community care side. Uh, and we were going to have a, a church camp for the, for the members of the church. It was to be in March uh, last year. And it was just after the bushfires. Yeah. And one morning, uh, Christy Buckingham, senior pastor, came in and said to me, uh, she came in all excited, with, which she often did with ideas. <laughs> you know, one of these people has 10 ideas before breakfast, yeah, right. some, of them, some of them good. Uh, and she said, you know, I've been thinking we, we should, we should uh, put it to the congregation that, that we won't go ourselves to have our family camp. Uh, some of us will go and we'll give that site down in Phillip Island to the uh, bushfire, the, the firefighters, well, yeah, yeah right. and, their, and their families. Mm -hmm. And over a hundred of them uh, came. Uh, it was all paid for by the church. We did some fundraising, well, but a lot of people who'd already paid to go to the camp said, Oh, we'll just keep it, you know. You know, keep it, give it to the firefighters. Yeah. So, and that happened really rare, very quickly, and uh, it was very impressive to see how they could do that. It's a bit frightening as an administrator because mm. you know suddenly On everything everything changes. Next. Um, but uh, it's it was quite a rare experience to be able to pivot a whole organisation that quickly. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And then I guess the other thing is you can also reflect back and, and what was it that you still treasured about home or about here. Um, when you were there in a different environment, different church culture? Well, uh, it was a very different worship culture. Mm -hmm. Not unfamiliar to Judy and I because we've had a lot of experiences just, you know, God has given us this great life that we've had so far. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been many places and seen um, faith expressed in worship in a whole bunch of different ways. Mm -hmm. But our personal traditions are much more like we experience here at uh, Warnerville. Um, uh, that you know I'm from a Methodist background she's from a Presbyterian background um, but we've worshipped in low Anglican and Church of Christ uh, churches as members and worshippers over you know some years so we we miss this what we have here um, the 1030 service is our favorite place mm. uh, because it's a mixture of uh, some tradition uh, and some of the more contemporary style of, of, uh, of worship and, and music. Um, so we, we miss that because uh, the charismatics are a different breed. But you know, the, the thing is you find God, you find God in, in worship everywhere. Mm. You know, I was sitting in a place and nothing to do with um, the last two years, but uh, I was in Soweto yeah. in South Africa for a, for a church service once. Well, mm. that's just somebody who prays for 15 minutes yeah. and it's like an operatic performance. Yeah. And it's, you know, that, that was a very powerful experience that I'd never experienced before, but just the sense of the Holy Spirit there was very strong. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, it is amazing. So we in another culture and you see people expressing their heart and love for the Lord Jesus in that mm. culture. Mm. Um, well, it makes you reflect on your own. It does. Yeah. Mm. Um, now, in some ways, you, you had reached the zenith of your career in World Vision, as, and then you had a, another job, but then moved into retirement for eight years, mm -hmm. and then back into employment for mm -hmm. two. Yep. So, yeah, just wondering what, you, what God has taught you about the way he works in your life and guides you. Okay, well, I think God thinks I'm nuts, probably, but um, <laughs> uh, because that... Well, I think what, what God has taught me, especially through these last two years, uh, it's reminded me that 
I'm not as sharp as I used to be. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, in my seventies. Judy's in her seventies as well. Although, you know, it's hard to believe. Uh, and we've um, that that break away from full time work. Um, I, I didn't realise how much uh, it it took to get going again. You know yeah. how, how much energy it it takes. And I also didn't realise how more difficult it is at 70 than it is, say, at 50. Mm. So that was a good lesson. I'm not saying I didn't, wasn't able to do the job. I was, because it was a smaller job than I'd done uh, previously. Um, and I was quite happy with, with the contribution I made there. So were they, I think. And, uh, but you have to realise that there are seasons in our lives and we need to adapt our, um, the, the challenges we, are, we accept from God. Now, <clears throat> what does that also tell me about you're asking specifically about how God works. Well, I think he works to teach us those kinds of lessons. Mm. But the other thing is, um, he also teaches us to, or in my case, I think it's different for, for, for all people, but in my case, God uh, leads me to look at things that match my interests and enthusiasms, mm. put it that way. Um, and when I test those things with other Christians, primarily, primarily with Judy, first of all, we might yeah, talk course. about, look at that, you know, I could do that. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you get the affirmation from two or three wise counsellors and that all lines up, then you go and do it and then um, you discern retrospectively. Mm. You're looking back, you say, uh, yeah, I can see God was working in that, mm. you know, mm. and I can do that for my whole life. Mm. Or I can't think of a thing I took on that uh, wasn't rewarding, some, not always in the way you thought it was going to be, but mm. not that wasn't rewarding in some way that you say, yes, God was at work in this. Yeah, mm. yeah well, I think what I'm hearing you say is um, you've got three, three things there that are feeding back into your decision making. One is your actual own ability, your mm. age and your stage of life, yep. what you can take on. Um, two is your passions and your desires, mm. and then thirdly, your Christian community. And yes. Yeah, you're working decisions with God it. speaks through those Prayerfully, three things. Yeah, and prayerfully yeah. you're working through that. Seeking of course, mm. yeah. Um, well, what, what about now? What are, are you and Judy are back in Warrnambool, retired? What are you looking forward to? Oh, well, um, there's still some things to do. I've just launched a book, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a bit of work there, um, uh, and it's going well, so I hear. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are still things I can do for the church and, and perhaps in the community, but we're not seeking beyond the church at the moment. Uh, and those things will match our capabilities and provided we have time to recover from anything that requires a lot of energy, uh, we'll, we'll be fine for a few more years yet. But, but, you know, gradually we'll taper off until the Lord takes us away and that'll be fine. That will be fun. We're loving having you back. It's great that you can be in fellowship with us. Oh, we're so good. Glad to be back. Really glad. Let's take a moment to pray. Let's. Mm. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the way you work in our life and uh, the people that you bring in and out of our lives and the places that you take us. Thanks for Philip and Judy and for um, their connection with us uh, through the first eight years, uh, for how you've continued to teach them and give them opportunities to, for service. Uh, at Bayside Community Church over the last couple of years. And we pray, Lord, that as they return, in keeping with their age and stage of life, uh, that they are able to take up those opportunities um, to love and serve your people here, to continue to have fellowship with us. And, uh, Father, we do thank you for them, the blessing that they are to our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And Meg's going to continue praying. Let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the midst of another lockdown. Many of us are feeling frustrated, disappointed and worn out from the constant changes. You have made us social, relational beings and lockdowns force us to be separated. We pray that we would seek fellowship and relationship through phone calls, FaceTime and any other means to keep us connected to each other and to you. We pray for those in our communities struggling with mental health or domestic violence. Keep our eyes and ears open to the people around us who might be suffering. Give us boldness to help those we know of without being asked. Encourage to ask for help if we are such struggling. 
Protect those who may be facing increased violence in their homes when there is no one else to go. Give them courage and opportunity to reach out and meet them with someone who can help. We pray for the governments and authorities who are working hard to manage the outbreaks of COVID-19. Give them clarity and wisdom around the decisions that affect the lives and futures of our families and communities. We pray that they communicate clearly, truthfully and calmly with each other and with the public. We pray that this lockdown would indeed be short and that people will cooperate despite any frustrations they may feel. We pray for schools and families thrown into remote learning once again. Thank you for the flexibility that teachers have shown to such rapid changes and their commitment to the children's learning. Prompt worn out parents to speak words of kindness and encouragement to their children. Help teachers and families to find creative ways to continue learning and experience your creation. Lord God, we recognise your sovereignty over all of creation, even the COVID-19 virus. We ask that your will be done through all actions and decisions, and that ultimately, ultimately, your glory will be revealed through Jesus' return. We pray all these things through Jesus' name. Amen. As we're looking at the Trinity today, we're going to take a minute to recite the Nicene Creed together. This creed is a bit longer and the words are a little different to what you might be used to because we typically use the Apostles' Creed that focuses on Jesus' humanity. The Nicene Creed focuses on the divine nature of God in three persons and it came about in 325 AD when Emperor Constantine acted in response to the heretic teachings of a man called Arius. The Arian heresies, as they're known, taught that Jesus was a created being, that he was not like God who was without beginning or end, and that Jesus was not divine in nature. This teaching was dividing the church. So Constantine called together the Council of Nicaea, a gathering of bishops from all over the Roman Empire. They came up with this creed that would put a stop to these heresies by stating clearly that Jesus was of the same substance as God. And more than this, it clearly shows how the three divine persons are equal, but have different roles in their unity as one God. So please read along with me as we make this statement of faith together. The words will come up on the screen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were created. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we come to read God's word, let's sing our praises to God for what he has done for us through Jesus.
Hi, we're the Furusa family. I'm Blessing. I'm Hayley. I'm Oliver. I'm Ruben. Today's Bible reading is coming from Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 28. At the time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am, I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days. Being tempted by Satan, he was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As now, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake. For so they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they let their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James son of Zebedee and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Well, thanks for reading for Roosters. And we are now in the second of our Term 3 series on doctrines. And as I mentioned last week to our folk at Warnable, uh, we're not exactly exegeting a passage, but we're kind of taking a passage that reflects um, something of the doctrine that we're studying. And I'll be really honest with you, it was really hard this week to find a particular passage um, that carries a, a lot of the weight of what it means for God to exist in Trinity. Um, that's something that's built up um, through the progressive revelation of God in the person of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we touch on quite a lot of readings through the course um, of, of our teaching this morning. I wonder how often you've heard someone say, all religions are the same. You know, there's a God, you pray, uh, there are rights and wrongs, good and bad, and generally they're pretty much the same across all the religions. Uh, there's an afterlife with reward or punishment, depending on how you've done uh, in this life. Such a statement, I think, betrays real ignorance. N ignorance not just of Christianity, but of all religions that actually vary tremendously um, from one another. One of the many doctrines that sets Christianity apart from other religions is the doctrine of the Trinity. We believe that there is one God, uh, and many other religions believe that as well, but we believe that that one God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that the Father is God, we believe the Son is God, and we believe the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, uh, there is only one God, but he exists in three persons. <laughs> Have you got it? It's tricky. It's quite humbling, actually, because our finite, very physical, concrete minds uh, struggle to understand. And that's okay, uh, because we're talking about God. And it should be no surprise that when we start talking about God, he doesn't exist in the defined categories that we're quite familiar with as we inhabit the physical world. But that doesn't mean that we settle with simplistic um, metaphors which are often erroneous representations of God, like by saying that God is like an egg. 
you know, and uh, with the shell and the white and the yolk. That's actually quite unhelpful because the shell is not an egg and neither is the white an egg or the yolk. Um, and again, we might have a three leaf clover, you know, someone might say a shamrock, but any one part is not the whole substance. Um, in another sort of failure of metaphors, we can say that water or H2O, H2O can exist as solid, liquid or gas. But the error is that under any set time and conditions, the water will only be solid, liquid or gas. But when it comes to God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, he can exist together at the same time, even in the same place. And we'll see that um, in some of the scriptures that we look at. For example, like in the baptism that we just had read for us by the Pharisees, where God the Father speaks from heaven as God the Son is immersed in water and God the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove. Um, mm. So we say there is one substance in three persons. That's the language we're going to use, God existing in Trinity. And Trinity is not a word that is found in the Bible. And for that reason, some churches have refused to use it or believe in the doctrines behind it. But we would say that it is a word that has become very helpful to describe how God has revealed himself progressively in the scriptures. Uh, so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to walk through the way God has revealed himself um, and trace the path of this developing understanding of God existing in Trinity. Let's pray and ask for God to help us to do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we learned last week, you are a God who reveals yourself through your word. And uh, we have your word uh, in the word of the prophets recorded for us in the person of your son and uh, in the apostles, the eyewitnesses who were there writing uh, under the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you that we have come to know you as our Father because of the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we've come to know you as one God in three persons. Father, we pray that as we reflect on that this morning, you would open our eyes, our vision, our come to understand your majesty and glory as one God in three persons. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's be really honest that before the Word of God, the Son of God, took on human person and came into what among us, God's people did not have a developed understanding of the Trinity, God existing in Trinity. If you read the Old Testament, it's only in hindsight really that you can see the hints of God existing in Trinity. There's nothing specific there in the Old Testament that makes it clear that one God exists in three persons. But there are hints. The first actually comes in the first chapter, in Genesis chapter 1, in the creation story, where we come to, to the creation of humankind in God's image in verse 26. And the rhythm and the pace of the creation story slows down in verse 26 as God comes to the pinnacle of his creation, creating humankind. And, it, and God reflects and says, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness. Now the plural is not a mistake. Sure, it jumps out at us as we read in it in English, but in the Hebrew text and in the Hebrew culture, it was certainly a disguised reference to any plurality in the Godhead. Uh, the Hebrew word for God was Elohim. El meaning God and Him is actually a very, it's a plural ending in the Hebrew language. Um, but the Hebrew people would not have necessarily understood that as an explicit reference to being three persons in one God. Uh, because, if you like, it could have been seen as a use of the royal we. Now, um, sometimes and not very often nowadays, we can still use that. I might be talking about uh, my own practice and I might say, well, we don't do that. <laughs> it's a use of the royal we. But having said that, let us make man in our image according to our likeness is a disguised hint of plurality. Of course, with the knowledge of what we learn in the New Testament, it becomes blazingly obvious. Because in the New Testament, say Paul's writing to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 1, and he says, 
for by him all things were created, all things were created by him and for him, referring to the second person of the Trinity, God the Son. And of course, last week we know from reading John chapter 1 that the Word was there with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And of course the Word referring to the second person of the Trinity because the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so we understand that the Trinity was there in the creative act at the very beginning. And then we look at Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2 and it becomes even more obvious that there's a plurality of the Godhead there. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the Spirit was hovering over the waters and God said, the Word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. You know, there are other hints in the Old Testament when, uh, say, the Lord appeared to Abraham uh, and declared that he would provide Abraham and Sarah a son and also declared that he'd come to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And when the Lord appeared to Abraham, he appeared in the form of three persons. Again, nothing explicit, but maybe a hint that the one and only God can take on flesh and visit humankind. And there were three persons that addressed Abraham as the Lord. Now, it's not until the New Testament uh, that the Trinity becomes gloriously obvious. In fact, you might say uh, that there were a couple of introductions that opened up the possibility of a Trinity very early. And, and I'm thinking of two introductions. The first, the angel to Mary, but the second, of course, when Jesus came into Galilee at his baptism. The first, when the angel appears to Mary and says in Luke chapter 1, you, you will be with child. He will be great and he will be called Son of the Most High. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. That's the first introduction of the person who is Jesus. And we can see at the outset, God in Trinity is outworking his new covenant plan. The second introduction we get uh, to the Lord Jesus is when he comes into Galilee from Nazareth. We had it read for us uh, by the Pharisees in Mark chapter 1. Again, God in Trinity introduces Jesus at his baptism. Jesus in flesh, the person of his son, comes from Nazareth to Galilee. He's baptized by John. The Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. And the Father speaks from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I'm well pleased. Here are the three persons of the Godhead working together in different roles at the same time with the same purpose. And you know what? From then on we see it time and time again in the New Testament. I mean, the Christian baptism is a baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Paul will occasionally sign off his letters with a Trinitarian blessing, like in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, where he says, what's quite familiar to us, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we know that when we pray, we pray to the Father, in the name of the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we know when we worship, when we worship God, uh, we do that in the power of the Spirit, and our focus is upon the Son. Possibly, though, I think the clearest revelation of the Trinity is in the work of redemption. And uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, that glorious chapter, we see the Trinity at work in our redemption. And uh, where we're called by God, we're included in Christ, and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's how Paul sums up God's redemptive work in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, where he says, And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believe, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. 
Or again, in Titus chapter 3, Paul says, He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us generously, through Jesus Christ our Saviour, so that having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. And this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. Later in our series, uh, we'll be looking at uh, the person and work of the Son and the person and work of the Holy Spirit. But today we don't want to drown ourselves in complexity. I want us to help Um, I want to help us think about how our God exists as one God in three persons. And one thing I think is very important as we're talking about the Trinity is not to confuse the language, uh, because that leads us to all manner of confusion and error. Uh, The persons, the three persons, have a unity, but it should not be confused. For example, sometimes uh, people might challenge you and they might say, look, If Jesus was God and Jesus died on the cross, then doesn't that mean that God was dead for three days? You know, that we can say God died on the cross. No, we can't confuse the persons with the Godhead. We we say Jesus died on the cross. We talk about Christ being crucified or the Son of God being handed over to evil men and put to death. That's what happens to the second person of the Godhead. But we don't say God died. That's to confuse the persons with the Godhead. The other error we can make with language that leads to confusion is um, we know that the persons are distinct, but they are not divided. So the persons aren't working against each other as if, God the Father is a God of wrath and anger, and so God the Son goes to the cross to appease Him. And, uh, and then God the Father pours out His wrath and anger upon the Son, and it's like child abuse. We've heard that accusation um, by the new atheists. And then the Spirit is the comforter, you know, independently acting of the Father and the Son. No, not at all. We can say God is holy. And so, yes, the Father's wrath is being poured out. But we also say that Jesus is the Holy One of God who will come to judge. And we also know that even the Holy Spirit, um, when Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5, they drop down dead in judgment. But then at the same time, God so loved the world that He sent His Son, who of course has compassion on us, as harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd. And His Holy Spirit comes to continue the work of Jesus the Comforter when He's ascended to the Father in heaven. This is a fascinating and glorious union, three in one. But before you get lost in abstract ponderings, or like uh, Gilbert the Giraffe, you begin to feel dizzy, I want to close by referring to two very practical implications of the, of the Trinity. Because the Trinity is not just a doctrine for theologians locked away with their commentaries and their textbooks and their original languages. It is a very practical uh, doctrine for Christians as we work and live and play in this world according to the glory of God. The first is that God exists in loving relationship even before the creation of the world. This is huge because it means that the Judeo-Christian understanding of who God is, is that he's not an impersonal force, spirit force. Yes, he is a spirit, but he as spirit has always existed in relationship, in other person-centered loving relationship. God is love. He has always been. The Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, and the Holy Spirit loves the Father and the Son. And this is important because it means that loving interpersonal community is fundamental to reality. And so as humans, being made in God's image, other person-centered loving relationships are foundational to being human. 
Now this is not as self-evident as you might think. Especially today, as we're influenced by Eastern religions, um, lots of people think that they can have a spiritual experience on their own. And in fact, they purposely draw away from people, they draw away from the world, they meditate, they empty their mind, home, and focus on nothing, so that they can transcend these earthly realities and relationships in order to find peace. But Christian peace is peace with God through repentance and forgiveness. And yes, that does give us a sense of peace, but fundamentally, it's actually relational. And so yes, we do draw aside from people, we do draw aside from the pressures of this world in order to relate to the personal God, but it is not finding peace in emptiness. It is finding peace in reconciled relationship with God. That is a status, a relational status. And then, of course, the sense of peace comes with that. But then it also compels us to go out and enjoy loving and reconciled relationships with one another. Now, I know a person who is constantly seeking spiritual moments of peace and tranquility through meditation and yoga. But sadly, her relationships are conflicted and chaotic. And it never occurs to her that to be spiritual might be to go out and seek reconciliation in those relationships through repentance and forgiveness. In fact, I think that she would actually see that as a most unspiritual kind of thing. Her spirituality is all about trying to be removed from those stressful relationships in her life, to distance herself from them. A lot of our members are in the Warrnambool Prezi Church Facebook chat group. And if you do Facebook chat groups and you're not in our Warrnambool Prezi Church chat group, I encourage you to look at it, look it up. Uh, just this week, Liz Duncan shared a great article about why some of our Christian friendships are harder work than our non-Christian friendships. Now, you heard that right. The article talks about why our Christian friendships are harder work than our non-Christian friendships. And the underlying reason was that we don't choose our Christian friendships. Uh, the article reflects that sometimes uh, people will pull back from those Christian friendships because they are actually hard. They're actually costly. But godliness, godlikeness, should draw us into those relationships, even if they are hard, even if they don't give us a sense of peace, even if they're a little bit stressful. Because our God has always existed in loving community in Trinity, and He calls us to be like Him, loving others in community, to continue to go and to give ourselves, to humble ourselves, uh, to repent when we need to repent, to offer forgiveness when we need to offer forgiveness, and re-engage in relationships. Our God exists in Trinity, other person-centered loving relationships. It's very practical. And the second very practical implication of God existing in Trinity is that our God is a God of unity and diversity. The persons are equal, but they have and they have different roles. Now think of this: in the one Godhead, there is deep unity, one substance, but there are three persons, and those three persons are completely equal in power and glory, as our Catechism says. We'll get to that at the end, and they have different roles. The Father exists to glorify the Son. The Son exists to glorify the Father, and the Holy Spirit exists to glorify the Father and the Son. They are equal in power and glory, but the Son is obedient to the Father, and the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son to be at their bidding. We see that similarity in many human communities, but the, we see it most clearly in marriage. In marriage there is deep unity, one flesh but two persons. And the Christian picture of marriage is that the husband and the wife are equal in power and glory, but they have roles that reflect Christ and His church. The husband is the loving, self-sacrificial and servant head 
of the marriage and the wife submits to her husband's a husband as the church submits to Christ. But we also see it in other human relationships. There is unity and diversity. Equality, but roles in human society. Think of parents and children. Equal in value, having different roles. Uh, there are masters and slaves. In our modern world, we would say employers and employee. There are governments and citizens. Now, we feel a pinch on that one often. Equal in value, but different in roles. And as Christians, part of discipleship is to respect the role of the government in our life. In the church, in the body of Christ, many different parts, all equal in value but and having different roles, but making up one unified whole. God in Trinity, having very practical implications in our relationships. Who would have thought him up? No one. And that is exactly why we can be confident that it is true. We only came to this realization that God exists in Trinity because God's revelation of himself forced us there, kicking and screaming, if you like. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, we were told in Deuteronomy chapter 6, one of the most important verses in the Old Testament. Uh, but then we came to see him the one God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So rejoicing and delighting in that, he revealed himself as three persons in the one Godhead. Now may all glory and honor and power and dominion be to our God in three persons. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, it is incredibly humbling to come to know you as you have revealed yourself. One God in three persons, equal in power and glory. Heavenly Father, we pray um, that we would always come to know you in your majestic glory, that we would come to know the power of your unity and the diversity of your persons. Uh, Heavenly Father, help us um, as we grow in your likeness to be people absolutely committed to loving relationships in our various communities. Our husbands and wives, parents and children, uh, employers, employees, uh, sl uh, governments and citizens and in the body of Christ. Uh, Father, we thank you that uh, we can know you in part and we will know you face to face. And uh, so we pray, come Lord Jesus, come reveal your glory to us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a look at three um, catechism questions. And uh, hopefully they're going to come up on the wall beside me. I'm going to ask the question and you respond with the answer. What is God? God is spirit, infinite, eternal and unchangeable in his being. Wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. And are there more gods than one? There is only one, the living and true God. How many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one God, the same in substance, and equal in power and glory. We're going to sing again, and when uh, the angel announced to Mary that she would be the bearer of the Son of God, she burst out into a song of praise in Luke chapter 1. Some of that song has been put to a hymn, Tell Out My Soul. Let's praise God together.
Well, thanks so much for joining us for our service. And um, as we close, can I encourage you to reach out to someone, um, even as this service just finishes. Uh, give someone a bell, uh, a buzz, who you might know is also watching the service. Reflect on something that you've been encouraged by, uh, something that you learned, something you were challenged by, um, and even pray together over the phone or whatever medium it is that you're reaching out to them. Uh, think of people in our church who maybe are living on their own. Uh, maybe even people who don't have access to the internet and, um, and give them a buzz. Remember um, to reach out. Our God is a God of relationship. And so here's the first challenge of being one of um, who's made in his image and committed to the body of Christ. Don't just sit there with what you've got. Um, go and uh, reach out and uh, love someone. Show them some kindness. And uh, as we go, I'm going to close with the Shema, as it was known, Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verses 4 and 5, and a little bit to follow, um, where Moses says to the people of Israel, he's reminding them before they go into the promised land of Canaan, where there will be many gods, and he reminds them that they have one true and living God. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads and write them on, your city, on, on the door frames of your houses and on your city gates. You might not be venturing out to the city gates or walking along the road in this lockdown. But wherever you are, meditate on the command of God, the very word of God, knowing that he has revealed himself as one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and praise him. Amen.